It's been pretty amazing to be kind of at the at the forefront, at the cutting edge, to see all the uh, the luminaries in the field, and you find out that these these big names are just uh, people um, with a lot of common interests that overlap with yours, and who were only be too happy to talk with you about them. Yes, go. Thank you very much, CppCon, for having us. Uh, very proud to be there with uh, my partner, Antonio. We just announced uh, yesterday uh, that uh, we are in partnership on the, that we join forces, TP on Enflow, to build the best uh, CMake remote execution solution, but also to generally bring CMake in the remote on modern era. And uh, just small words about me, I'm a father of a little daughter of two, um, loving C++, uh, being a Boost contributor and the uh, founder of TP, and uh, Antonio. Yeah, Antonio, father of none that I know of, uh, <laughs> DevEx engineer at Engflow, and you know, we love making builds faster, but really everything from uh, tooling that has to do with developers. We want to make developers' life better. And one of these things for us is gonna be at least from now on, CMake. So let's get into it. Yeah, so basically this talk is named the CMake successor languages. And uh, I was inspired by uh, all the C++ successor languages that uh, popped up. And um, also we met with Antonio uh, earlier that year and uh, he, he said, yeah, everything else is better and so on. And we thought, and I showed him actually not. So this, uh, Talk is about giving uh, superpowers to CMake. And uh, the first thing we'd like to do and to say is thank you, CMake, because before there was AutoTools, QMake, scans, and happily, uh, CMake replaced them almost all, so we don't suffer that much anymore under them. And um, yeah, that's uh, our talk. And uh, interestingly, uh, we could solve, I think, safety issues that we are discussing about in the C++ um, community for a year um, with tooling and uh, with a good support of tooling. And uh, I was also inspired by the talk from Brett Brown at the CPP Snow, where he coined like the requirements from, uh, for C++ successor languages. And it there was uh, said, it must be CMake compatible because actually CMake is the de facto standard. And uh, I think it can take us to, to, the, to the goal that we want to reach is a, a safer uh, language and a safer development experience. So there is a lot of uh, talk going on uh, about safety. And um, just uh, the, the opening keynote from Bjarne uh, this, this, uh, this Monday was, uh, are we there yet? Because Bjarne has been putting a lot of effort with the CPP core guideline and so about safety. And uh, I thought, are we there yet is a reference, I think. I'm not sure, but I think it's a reference to the Rust website. There is a lot of Rust websites that says, are we thing yet, basically? And uh, they check if they have enough library for being game, for being async, and so on. And uh, in C++, I think everything is given already. Uh, we can do GUI, we can do async, and so But we are not sure if you are safe. I feel like we can be, do very good application, very safe application, very stable applications. In my past, I, I worked on embedded system that didn't uh, shut down uh, for years. And that was all in C++. And so I think we can do better, though. And uh, it's just that it requires a lot more tooling, a lot more um, build configuration, a lot more static analysis, dynamic analysis. And CMA can help us. And we should, because as you know, 70% uh, of the security vulnerabilities, as reported by the NSA and by Google and so, are due to memory safety issues. But you have all the tooling there to do that. So before I, uh, I jump into um, build systems in general on what they bring in comparison to CMake, I will show you a bit what we can do for safety pretty easily uh, right now. And then Antonio will show us how it is in the other build systems, like Bazel and so. And uh, I will uh, fire back with uh, CMake solutions. So one. Other thing is Timur Dumler coined uh, all these uh, safety, all these kind of safeties. I think uh, Sean Parent also, a lot of people were involved in finding these different kind of safeties. And I think, actually, we forget the other one. 
is what is that all, what does it help if we don't have like a build reproducibility, if we are not able to deliver or release on time to our end user? What does it bring if uh, we cannot trace back the binary to be exactly the sources we think it is, uh, if it has been uh, like infected by a virus or so? And um, I think it's very important that teams are able to deliver on time so they can release a bug fix or a hot fix, a security patch very fast, or just that they can iterate. And so I think, no, you don't need to write it in Rust. That being said, it's, it's a nice language as well, and it has also is, uh, is niceness, and it's very cool to mix both, actually. But uh, you don't need to rewrite it in Rust. Uh, and anyway, when you rewrite something, you add more bugs, uh, generally. <laughs> you, you do the, name, the same that you had before, and you have to fix it. So how can we achieve, achieve uh, safety in C++ today, uh, just simply? Um, the first thing is uh, the CPP core guidelines. Just a bit uh, for a question. Who uses the CPP core guidelines uh, checks uh, in his uh, daily work? Raise your hand. Like, uh, yeah, no, okay, it's, it's, it's not yet uh, unanimity. Uh, but perhaps it's because uh, people don't know how to enable the checks eventually. And um, actually you can, that enable that very easily with CMake and Clang Tidy. Um, it's very simple and it just works. You just have to define this variable in your CMake list. And then all the compiler, compiler invocation that you have, as long as Clang Tidy is, uh, is on your system, which uh, we ship in our uh, installer of, uh, of uh, CMake uh, and TP together and so. Um, you will have the checks immediately. And this is pretty cool because if we look at one example, um, if we take this uh, uninitialized uh, code, I will, I will, like here we are just incrementing a variable that is uh, uninitialized. It happens often to forget that because uh, you have to initialize uh, um, such variables but not uh, aggregate because they are automatically constructed. We hope that uh, the proposal that will initialize everything to zero will be, will be through, but for the moment it's not the case. And so if I run the build on that one, uh, actually uh, uh, running uh, our tool TP that calls into CMake, um, we get uh, immediately uh, an output, a warning that E is not initialized actually. And this is the CPP core variable init uh, variables. And the only thing we needed to do in the CMake list to enable that was to put this small variable. Nothing else is required, so you can start Right to, to, tomorrow when you get back uh, to, your, to your code, oh. Oh, yeah. uh, you can just set this variable and you already be a bit safer uh, in your daily development. That's very cool, it's, it's in CMake for so long. Um, so yeah. So the other thing is, how do we check memory safety, arithmetic safety, uh, thread safety and so on, like how to do it pragmatically uh, in C++ today? Uh, there is a lot of tools that uh, were developed by big companies, uh, notably Google gave, gave, put a big push in there, but a lot of others uh, joined, and Microsoft also uh, integrated in MSVC. And you, you can actually simply use a small module that we forked from uh, an author that is named Arsene M, um, because we integrated in a suite and so, and it's named uh, Sanitizer CMake. You just add it to your project, and uh, then you can use pretty easily any of the address sanitizers and defined behavior sanitizers, which can help to find uh, arithmetic uh, overflow and so on, and uh, all the other sanitizers that you can find in the uh, C++ uh, uh, um, tooling. And uh, like, if you want to use it, you just need to, uh, to, to write a small CMake list, and then uh, once you, you loaded the sanitizer uh, module, you can just uh, write add sanitizers. I think here it's a typo that it's missing the import, um, but basically that's, I oh know it's here, sorry, it's fine package sanitizers, and uh, then you, you can just use it. And so on the use after free example or, or program, it will ch do check at runtime, that means it will compile the binary with, uh, with checks that will be executed at runtime to find the things that a static analyzer cannot find, actually. And uh, I think that's very important because we cannot find, uh, we cannot static analyze on first everything without actually running a test on the real application in, with real user input, actually. The only thing is the sanitizers uh, are not so easy to set up because they are not um, compatible with another. 
So that starts to be problematic. You, 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 you wrote a small ad sanitizer, and then you would like to have all the checks, but you cannot do it in the same build. Uh, you cannot, uh, you cannot like, put Ubisan and as address sanitizer together. So you need to do two builds, and so two test executions. And uh, that's also the reason why we think uh, nowadays that you have cloud computation power on demand and so, and uh, that it's a good um, a solution to uh, be able to run all these tests in parallel on, uh, on uh, build farms so that you get instant feedback. And this is a bit what we try to do uh, together with Ventflow is bringing the CI to the developer's fingertips so that you know right away if you, if you have a problem or so. And, um, what we did in TP, and naturally you can also do it yourself, but we have that in our, in our standard package. Uh, we have uh, some additional toolchain files that you can add to your, uh, to your project, and it's just enabling the different types of sanitizers. And this can be used uh, very uh, easily, like this. If I take an example here, which is written in very horrible uh, C slash C++, um, it's uh, based on a story. I was two weeks ago at a conference in Norway, uh, C++ as well, and um, I, on the way in, I forgot my, my luggage in the train when I was in the airport in Switzerland, where we come from. But I, halfway, I remembered, and I jumped back in the train, and I could take it. And then the second time, I, when I arrived in Kongsberg in Norway, after two hours of train uh, from Oslo, I forgot it again, and then I ran to a... <laughs> To a, to, to a meeting uh, on a call, and then like at six in the afternoon, uh, I, and I noticed, oh my God, uh, I don't have my backpack, I have nothing, uh, just my laptop on the, on the toothbrush. Uh, and that's why I adapted this example. So um, the thing is, I think my brain is not implemented correctly in terms of error II, but it happens that we write this kind of code as well. And actually, if you uh, build uh, any of our CMake toolchain file uh, with the dash sanitized memory behind, then you actually ca can get the, um, the, the memory sanitization uh, done. And uh, you get uh, actually from the, the, the project uh, um, uh, sanit address sanitizers and so, you get uh, the different error and you can see it detected that there is an EPUs after three, uh, which is uh, actually here. We get access to the do not forget array that we already deleted. And it's actually pointing us at this uh, directly in our test developer loop. And um, that's, uh, that's pretty, pretty useful because you, you can simply click where the problem is and you can find how it was allocated there or so. And uh, you can use it in a way where uh, you, you will build uh, on every keystroke. So if you add the dot M behind, we run CMake in a loop on the C test in a loop. Um, I forgot to put test all. And uh, so if you, 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 you still have the, the output here, but if you happen to fix it, uh, then we should be fine. Uh, so we just return, one, return zero. And uh, then you don't need to wait on your CI that it runs all these checks, you get it instantly, and uh, you don't have the, the address, uh, the, heap after, the use after three error, actually. So that's one way. And then if you look at another example, like arithmetic safety, because this is not something you could really code on, uh, at compile time. Um, well, to some extent, but it depends how, how the value is at runtime. If it's zero, it shouldn't overflow. And if it's one, it overflows. And here we are just uh, going over the, uh, the, um, the number of uh, the maximum int uh, number. And uh, in that regard, uh, we see immediately that uh, we cannot represent this number in a type int, and uh, we can directly jump as well on where the problem is happening, actually. So, and this is just a matter of adding to your CMake list, uh, add sanitizers, and uh, running the build in the right toolchain. And if you have enough uh, computation power, you can also run them, then uh, a sanitize memory, um, and, uh, and so on in, uh, in parallel, so you get all the feedback instantly all the time. So that's basically what, uh, what, what we can offer in terms of improvement for safety. Um, and you can also use it yourself. If you don't want to use TP, you can use uh, CMake directly and, and build that. Um, and uh, that's basically what we are doing. No, we haven't spoken about um, dependencies, software dependencies, and uh, about uh, 
um, safety of the build on the software supply chain security. And uh, before doing so, I let uh, my partner uh, speak about uh, the different build system and how they approach that. Yeah, so, so ultimately, like you might have understood, this is a talk about build system, and especially about CMIC, but how did it came to be? So a, a few months ago, I was presenting in, in an open source event in Switzerland, and I went through my talk. I was introducing Baso, which is this build, open source build system from Google. Some of you may have heard about it. It's pretty cool, pretty advanced, a bit complicated, but it's, it's quite beautiful in my opinion. And I was talking about it, and I was making comparisons with other build systems, putting basically in a positive light. And I finished my talk, and I really want a fresh beer, just want a really cold beer. And I, to the, I tried to get my beer, but halfway through, I get this French guy in between me and my beer, screaming, qu'est-ce que c'est? can do this too. And this is how the talk came to be, I basically, I had to talk with this guy until I could get to my cold beer and discuss all the problems that CMA could face. And interestingly enough, he did manage to address all of them. At least all the ones that we put into the slides, because the other ones you're never gonna find out about. <laughs> so let's talk about some properties of build systems. I think the first property that comes to mind is our build system handles parallelism, right? How many things can you do in parallel at a given point? What's the maximum threshold you can reach? It's important to point out that these are things that can be done independently. So it's the maximum things that you can independently run at the same time, because if you're trying to run A and B, but B depends on A, you will never be able to run them in parallel. So it's always that maximum independent threshold. And I'm gonna be comparing a few build systems and go through different levels of how well they implement this. And let's start with Gradle. So a bit of an introduction about Gradle, because it might be unfamiliar for some of you, hopefully all of you, um, but Gradle doesn't have very granular targets. Gradle allows you to define a project, the main project, and sub-projects, like, hey, I have three libraries and a binary. I basically have four targets, which means that parallelism kind of sucks, because you can parallelize up to four, but really there are gonna be interdependencies, so you can barely parallelize at all. Matter of fact, this setting is disabled by default. So it's, it's really not great. Like, in a build system, you really do want to have a high level of granularity if you want to improve performances. Otherwise, you're kind of stuck with what you get out of the, out of the box. At the second level, we have make and fast build. They allow you to define the number of jobs you want to run in parallel. Pretty straightforward. I want to run 16 jobs in parallel because I have 16 cores, one core each. And that works, it's fine and dandy, until you try to have a much bigger uh, target in your, in your build. Let's say, for example, that you have lots of reasonable targets, and then you have a test that is trying to spin up a Kubernetes cluster with like 20 services, and your laptop just dies, and might make it even catch fire, honestly. And so you want a way to say, at that point, at this stage of the build, I want to have less parallelism because there is a target that consumes lots of resources. Bristol can allow you to define that, so if you know that you have resource-hungry targets, you can say, hey, this target consumes way more resources, so when you're running it, make sure that you're not running too much else. And so it limits the level of concurrency. I think this is still a bit of a crude mechanism. And the one I like the most, really, is what Ninja does. So Ninja allows you to define an arbitrary number of job pools. And each job pool can, can be correlated with a rule and can have its own level of parallelism. So you can say at link, time, uh, link targets, I want them to be done serially because they consume lots of resources, they take a lot of time, they may limit concurrency. Whereas compilation units, I, I want them to run with a high level of concurrency. Which begs the question, will CMake? And I'm gonna leave it at Dick to Damien. So naturally with CMake, because we generate for Ninja or for, or for Make, we can uh, also set uh, job pools and uh, we can do it even better than in Bazel. No, just kidding. Uh, it's, it's true. <laughs> and uh, basically you can defini define different kind of job pool, like here I have three, a compile one, a link one, uh, and a code gen one. And the link one, I use, I use only one machine for the, for the link because uh, link, uh, link stage is, um, is very intensive uh, in terms of, uh, of memory usually. So perhaps you have one node that is dedicated for this. And uh, then um, you, you actually can uh, set which target uh, is using which pool, and that means you can also 
uh, attach like a custom target, like a protocol buffer, uh, source file generation to a special jot pool, which can also uh, be dedicated to a special kind of uh, runner. And uh, this is the kind of cool stuff you can do when you can distribute your builds across many, many machines. So that's about parallelism, but what about reproducibility, Antonio? Yeah, because like at some point, nothing really matters if your build is constantly changing, right? If you try to produce your same binary over and over again, but it changes under the hood without you realizing, there is no caching, cache, no parallelism, no nothing that can make your builds truly fast. So what do we mean by reproducibility? Uh, given the same inputs, the same configuration, and the same command, a target will always generate the same output, identical bitwise to its previous iteration with the same input and same configuration. And so why is this important? It's important because if, if, an out, if an output does not change, then we can cache it. It's important because if we have the same binaries, no matter where we build them, it's easier to debug them in case a problem occurs. And it, this time, it, it's not great at the beginning, but it's making engine fast build. They don't really make any guarantee about reproducibility. It's up to the developer to do that, which does not mean that achieving reproducibility is impossible with these build systems. It's just that it's up to you. The tool is not trying to facilitate that. They're just trying to build the software. If it's reproducible or not, that is really up to you. And in the next level, we have Mason. Mason does provide some tool chains, also some curated tool chains that you can use out of the box. And it also allows you to introspect tools and figure out, hey, this compiler has this feature, this other has this feature. So what flags do I need to use to get, to get identical builds between different versions? Even better than that, Gradle predefines a bunch of robust uh, tool chains out of the box. Uh, they do not depend on anything si installed system-wide, which is a really important property. Because the moment you rely on something that is installed system-wide, nothing is stopping other developers from installing a different version, and you get unreproducible builds. But the problem with that is that it mostly just works for Java and Kotlin, which seems to be a common problem with Gradle, because it is meant for, that, for those languages. And it's not as, as easy as to configure and get it right as it is, for example, for Bazel. Uh, I don't mean to say that it's easy. It's, it's hard. It's pretty hard, honestly. <laughs> if you've done it once, you probably regret doing it. But once it works, you know that it, it, you have certain guarantees about how it works. And you know you're going to have reproducible builds from now on. Furthermore, in Bazel, there, uh, there is this concept of rules, which are basically like functions in CMake. And there are rule sets, which are collections of rules for specific languages or technologies. And usually, that complexity is then inside those rules. So we achieve reproducibility, but it's more extendable. And it's often just configured out of the box for very well-known rule sets. So once again, may ask the question, will it CMake? Naturally, yes. But uh, yeah, there's some, some topics to be dealt with. Um, I mean. Uh, we don't have a default in CMake for rep totally reproducible uh, binaries. Um, the first thing is the good practice is to list the, the, the file in, uh, in the CMake list, and uh, so our ordering is guaranteed. And CMake is also ordering them when you generate the compile line and the, the link line and so on. And ordering is not necessarily modified. But it's also the reason why you don't put in CMake list the file blob recurse and so uh, to find all the CPP file. Uh, the, the, the other thing is, um, what do we do with our toolchain? Because you need to configure the compiler to not do strange stuff like inject the hour of the build or the date of the build in your, uh, in your binary. People like to do that, but the version header have the, the time it was built. But that's already painful to be able to binary diff uh, the two, uh, two different uh, binaries. And um, actually, for MSVC, there is, a, there is a link option that you can add to your toolchain, which is BRepro. It's not uh, documented, but uh, it works. Um, for um, the, the, the GCC, on GCC, you can uh, set uh, source that epoch at um, environment variable. And this uh, allows to set uh, a given date for the, for the date on time. Uh, but you can also use uh, the, the fact of re, re, resetting building macros so you can fix the date on the time of the build. And uh, then you, you, can, you always have the same out of the box. And uh, we tend to do that in our toolchain to be able to uh, allow uh, this um, uh, reproducibility and reuse of cache entries and so on. 
Um, but uh, another thing is when you uh, start to use like super cool optimization, like link time optimization, then you start to generate randomly named symbols uh, for, uh, for the optimization. And so you are kind of stuck on the, one of the way to avoid it uh, is, uh, is basically setting the random seed that the compiler is using. Um, so, so that uh, when it does the FLTO, we use a defined seed on using the checksum of the file uh, might be a good uh, solution. There can be others, it's depending on the code base. Um, but this allows to have, still have the optimization without necessarily uh, losing, the, uh, without losing the reproducibility of the build. So this is the kind of stuff that you can do in your builds to, uh, to ensure reproducibility. But there is one last one that is very painful. Uh, it's file. And um, this one, um, actually, there are solutions, but they are not the same for each compiler. Some compilers have known. And uh, it's just the, the only way to deal with that is either you might manage to strip them all away after you build it, uh, which will break your code because some things, like for example, the Qt library, uh, they do filtering on, uh, log, on log entries based on the uh, file macro. And this you will lose uh, instantly if, uh, if you do that. And there is a solution, though, uh, is to build everything in the same path, in the same host, and so on. But it's just very painful, and only the CI can do that, usually. But we, uh, by enabling a CMake automatic caching, what we do is actually we clone all the source trees of the developers in a central location, also in non-virtualized uh, um, uh, non non environment, also on your host. And uh, basically, we take the workspace of the user and do kind of a git hard, hard cloning, hard link cloning in uh, some central location in, uh, in CTP or in user local TP uh, to guarantee actually the file position. And uh, so all the binaries that are built there and all the sources that are built there, they are totally free to unpack somewhere else that is using this same uh, build command because everyone will have the same path and so you don't have any, any problem. And uh, we had a discussion earlier this week that with BMI for modules, it would be a problem for uh, um, transferring this, and we think we could use that uh, to, make it, uh, to make it work. And uh, this is very cool because with that, we also make the, the invariant source tree uh, addressable by version, and we can restore um, build machine very fast. So you just need to merge Git, Ninja, and uh, have a binary caching strategy. Um, to, to actually be able to have the file problem solved. We did that. Um, we have always the same files when you build uh, an application. Um, yeah. So I could show something. So, I, I, I don't think it's, in, it's super interesting that I show like uh, two builds like um, necessarily, um, uh, like this is like the options that I mentioned before and so. And actually the only thing I wanted to show is uh, perhaps for those that don't know, there is, um, there is a cool tool that is named Diffoscope that you can use to uh, actually uh, check your, uh, your, your binaries. And here I have two tools that were built uh, uh, one after the other. And uh, so to determine if your build is very reproducible or so, uh, even with a change, uh, you can actually use the diffoscope tool, which normally should show the diff between the two. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and this is a very cool tool because you can see what, uh, what was changed between the two binaries. It uh, also brings you the, 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 the assembler, and uh, if you have the case that you really want to do just a change that is very um, uh, precise, then uh, you can check what was changed, and you will notice, ah, this is this function, and if I remove it, uh, despite having the... Despite uh, having the... the, the <clears throat> The, tat, the date and time in the log output here, uh, I will still be able to get the same, um, the same uh, build out of it, and then I can check. Uh, I broke something. Did I work? Oh. 
should have worked. I think it's because of the of the escaping of date and time. Uh, so this function, we have to call it. Yeah, that sounds like I touched the uh, I touched the variables. Surely, actually. So I'm still make escaping, but we normally have in your toolchain files. Here I'm doing it manually for the demo. So because I'm 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 more on the on the business side in the moment, I, I tend to be a bit less uh, less efficient. So so I really don't like it. Uh, should have worked. Very strange. So that's not so good. Mm, should be able to. Pretty sure it worked just before, but that I had. I don't know why it's not. Uh, It's a it's a it's a string escaping topic. It's a love letter to CMake, but it's it's sometimes hard to get the string escaping right. Um, so. CMake doesn't love you back. <laughs> 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 yeah, that's true. So it's just because it doesn't happen to to do the um, the build with the right uh, with the right escaping, but that is also weird because that should that is not possible in principle. Yeah, that would find it hard to. So it seems there we have a small mistake. Um, we could also nullify them, but that's not always good. So if we do that, so okay. oh, yeah, because it's empty. Okay. So I think I'm. I, I will. I will uh, check back. Uh, uh, on first, I, I come to the to the solution in the meantime. Uh, sorry for this, uh, but in principle, you can set the the date and time like this. And uh, this is what we do in a tool chain. It should be done differently. Uh, I somehow thought I could show it live. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's it's a hard problem, but uh, you can have uh, this tool Defoscope that helps you find out the difference between binaries. So that being said, uh, let's move to caching, which sure, also requires reproducible binaries. Uh, and uh, I will draw, grab the, the example from our toolchain file afterwards. I mean, if you want to see them in code after, just like stay here. Yeah. We're going to see him struggle with macros. It's going to be lovely. Uh, on to the next property. As you said, it, caching does depend on reproducibility. If you produce different outputs each and every time, you can't cache them because they've changed. And how do build systems do that? Because it really relates how fast a, on how fast a build can be. If you don't do work, you can't get any faster at doing work. Level one, once again, Gradle. Uh, low granularity of targets is really, really, really bad for build performances. And so Gradle does not fare well, once again. Because you, if you change a single file in a sub-project, then the whole sub-project needs to be rebuilt. And so does every dependent sub-project. At level two, we have Make and Ninja. They do have a file system cache, both of them. It's based on M time, so if the M time changed between this build and the next build, then that target is going to be rebuilt. But it's it's just just file system caching. I, th I think we can do better than that. And the first one that does better than that is fast build. So with fast build, you can already have uh, a first initial form of distributed caching. So you can have a shared system, usually remote, where you have all the cache from all your builds, it being CI builds or local development builds, and they can all share the same cache, which is pretty great, because then you get cache sheets populated from CI, and your development becomes much, much faster locally. Sadly, though, fast build is limited as to what it can build and cache, and it's mostly just limited to C and C++, with big asterisk in there. Once again, Bazel, because it's language agnostic, and forces the same invariance regardless of the language that you use, it can cache pretty much whatever you can think of. 
The biggest difference is that this time, instead of uh, using the M time to check for cache uh, expiration of the inputs, it checks on the con it, it uses the content. So the, the cache in, in Bazel is, uh, is pretty much content addressable. So you, you do a digest of the file and you use that to address things inside Bazel. It also has an additional cache for the build graph in memory. So if you have a huge, huge build, which is in sometimes you have in big organizations, then you don't necessarily need to recompute the whole graph, but only the things that have changed since, which sometimes can, be, can last up to a few minutes. So having this additional in-memory cache that is persisted throughout builds is very helpful in improving build performances. And hopefully the next demo is going to work, so I'll leave it once again to my friend Damien. Thanks, thank you. You're welcome. Um, so for caching, in CMake, uh, out of the box, we have a CMake cache.txt, but that only cache the configuration phase, so it doesn't really cache builds. Uh, I heard there are people that have 500 megabytes big uh, CMake cache, which is pretty heavy. It's very interesting. But CMake in itself doesn't have a caching uh, solution. Uh, that's why uh, we uh, build that, and it's what I showed before. And in our integration that we uh, named uh, remote execution for CMake, CMake RE, we have two layers of caching. There is one first layer that is actually the one I presented before that is uh, centralizing the build in a, in a single directory and uh, making actually a snapshot for each commit. And uh, each of these snapshots are then deduplicated and compressed uh, together uh, so that you can uh, save, uh, like for example, 300 revision of t 10 gigabytes build tree from, um, from LLVM, for example, can be compressed to 100 megabytes. And so this allows to have all the build trees really fast on a machine that gets deployed. Like if you are running the build in the CI and you want the CI to uh, start on a fresh disk because it's where the CI machine gives you that, then this cache is gonna help you uh, get the machine in the state as if it will be a developer uh, laptop. And uh, then when you want to parallelize the actual build and get more out of the, um, out of the, the, the queue that is, uh, that, that you have uh, in your CI, if you want to reduce the queue and have uh, less CPU cores per build, uh, then the second level of caching is the one that Bazel is doing uh, in your remoting uh, technology. So per each uh, per transition unit, there will be a cache entry created. And uh, this allows when you have like two developers or three developers pushing at the same time their pull request, uh, then it goes super fast and it reduces the amount of cores you need to pay for in the cloud or you need to have in the cloud to be able to build all this free because this is instantly available and only one of the, the build engine is doing the build and uh, the resume of the machine is done by the L1, L1, L1 build cache. And uh, this is kind of a good uh, synergy uh, that uh, in at first we thought, oh, that will be strange and so on. And then we thought about it and we started uh, benchmarking. And it's actually very good because uh, you save a lot of uh, time starting up new machines and uh, you also uh, save a lot of time building. Um, yeah. So let's, let's start talking about dependency management. This is, this is kind of like in parallel to what most build systems do. And it's not necessarily a property that every build system has. Not every build system knows how to handle dependencies. And sometimes the way to handle dependencies is just having them on your local file system or having a dependency manager. But some build tools do know how to handle dependencies. So let's look into that. So the first category is the one I just mentioned. You don't support dependency management. It's not your problem and you just don't look at it, which can be a reasonable position, but it's not necessarily good in terms of development experience. It does make the setup do a bit more flexible, much harder to configure. And we do want to make build systems easier for developers because then they will adopt more of the best practices. They will benefit more from, from them. Second level is, is Gradle. Actually, the dependency management is quite nice, but it's mostly focused on what is good for Java and it's, it doesn't allow much more flexibility outside of that. So it could, be, it could rank much, much higher, but it's stuck at level two because it's only ending jars. Level three, we have Mason and Bezo, uh, which sounds very similar. Um, they, they provide a very extensible mechanism. It's very similar in both cases. Uh, and you can resolve dependencies in any language. There is no real restriction there. And the nice part is that they also both provide central repositories where they have a curated selection of, um, de of dependencies that have been crafted and patched in a way that it works best with your build system. 
This way you don't, need, no, you don't even need to think about it that much. You just pull a dependency, declare that dependency, and the build system does everything automatically for you, and it automatically works into the system. But will it see make? So yeah, package management in C++, there are many solutions. Uh, and they all compete. Uh, we even had a talk uh, this uh, Tuesday uh, plenary about uh, having a solution to make them communicate and uh, work together, the CPS format. And uh, actually, um, I think CMake is the de facto standard. Um, it has basically transformed the C++ ecosystem. And it kind of starts to feel way more homogeneous uh, as it was in the past due to the effort. And actually, CMake is, is a good solution for a package manager. Like, we have fetch content. So why not just use that? Everyone loves it. It's simple. It's easy. Um, and uh, you can just write, give me boost. It's there. Uh, name it boost on its uh, this tag. And uh, I want uh, to make it available and link it to my uh, application. Um, here, there is a missing the add executable. It is on, a, on another line. But basically, this is enough to get dependent on boost. The, the, the thing with that is, uh, if, we, uh, if we try it out, it's a bit slow. Um, let's uh, try it out. And so if I take this example here, and uh, I build it with CMake. So now I Um, Kadir build uh, CMake, so I am gonna go in there to do the, the fetch content. There is catch and there is boost as well here. It's also the 180. I just put the, the commit instead of the of the tag, so it's really the boost library. And I run this and I say I want to build the ninja for my host. Um, then I get the detection and then I get into this state where. It's downloading the sources, and then it will build it locally. And here we are on an hotel Wi-Fi, so nobody wants to wait that to start hacking with the library, actually. So fetch content is cool, but it's a bit uh, uh, expensive to, um, to actually uh, be able in time to start, to start to use a new library and so. So there is a solution, is uh, that we wrap CMake with TP, and we use the TP caching uh, for, uh, for the, the dependencies. Um, and we, we did that as such, uh, that we can actually inject our own uh, dependency provider for fetch content, so that we actually don't need to download the sources, but we actually automatically uh, are able to uh, use our cache for this. So it's a nice feature that is in the recent version of CMake, it's the, tip, the dependency provider. Uh, it's actually a, a macro that you define that can actually uh, do, do what normally fetch content will do. And if it doesn't set the, the, fetch con the, the dependency as populated, then it resorts to the default uh, fetch content uh, logic. And so what we do uh, in our case is that we, and you can also implement it yourself with this, uh, with this feature in uh, CMake 3.24, it's, uh, it's possible. Uh, you set the, the CMake languages. Uh, set dependency provider, and you say I'm a, a, a dependency provider for fetch content. And then the only thing you have to do is to say in your top level project or on the command line of CMake or in the toolchain file that this file has the right to override the underlying CMake mechanism. And actually, what we did is that uh, we uh, use our build caching on our install caching uh, for uh, the, 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 the the retrieval of the dependencies. So instead of calling CMake direct, directly, we call CMake with TP that sets this uh, dependency provider. Uh, yes. And uh, then what happens is that uh, when you find the fetch content entry, you actually say, uh, we need uh, the dependency. It, it looks in the, in the TP cache. And uh, then it looks for boost as well. And uh, then we are done. And uh, we have like restored boost and the um, on the, 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 the catch library without having to download their sources, without having to compile them. So we just have it uh, out of the box. And uh, this is uh, open source. Everyone can use it, hack it on. 
There is no lock-in. If you don't have uh, TP or CMake area, so you can still use fetch content. It will just be slower. Uh, it works like a build from sources. So you, are, you have the freedom to change flags, and then it will be cached to re for the first person that builds that. And uh, it's still based on efficient and secure build caching. It's on GitHub, slash TP build, CMake TP provider. Uh, we'll see in the next step that it has even more. Um, I don't know about Bazel, S-Bombs, and so. What is the, the state of the affair for C++ there? Uh, I'm not quite sure. It, it sounds like a pending story to me, so I'm not sure how to, uh, how to respond to that, to that question, actually. OK. Because actually, CMake is very good at generating S-Bombs. And who, have, who would have thought that? Um, what is uh, SBOMS is the software bill of material. It's basically the list of all the files that uh, were involved in the build and all the files that are shipped to the end users on all the dependencies with the licenses on the various different formats. But uh, uh, one of the formats that has been uh, standardized from the Linux Foundation is the software uh, um, package data exchange uh, format, which is SPDX. And uh, this is uh, required for uh, the US uh, National Telecom and the uh, uh, industry uh, association agency, uh, and there is uh, some compliance validation that you can do on it. And CMake is capable of all this, actually. Um, and how it is? It's uh, by a module from uh, someone that I don't even know uh, for the moment that is uh, named CMake SBOM. Uh, it's very cool. It's a way to produce a guided uh, SBOM. And uh, the thing is, you have to do everything by hand with that. So it generates the format and so on, but you don't have any automatism. So as we are able to determine which library it is because we have the fetch content um, uh, integration, uh, we can actually automatically detect uh, which libraries and which files you have. And you can, uh, with your small modular TP, automatically generate uh, the SBOM that you need. And uh, so here, this is the, the code that you will do to set up your, uh, your, your project, saying, uh, I'm this uh, supplier. Uh, I'm, uh, I want to, to check your SPD, I want to generate SPDX. Then you have your app, and uh, then you want to install that app, and you want to generate the SBOM for the install things only, because this is the package you ship to your user, to your customers. And uh, this, at the end, generates an SBOM. And because we have this uh, integration, um, we, you don't need to do it for all the libraries. That is uh, done by TP, essentially. Uh, you just need to select which part of your application you want to install and you want to generate SBOM with. And this looks like this. Uh, still here. With the dependency provider, if you want to generate SBOM, it's possible. You just need to, to install your, uh, your target, like it's the same as CMake install. Um, and uh, then you have uh, automatically uh, the check for your uh, SBOM if it's uh, NTR um, com compliant. And uh, you can find it uh, in the clown build. In the install tree, you find the SBOM for the commit ID. Uh, there is some modification in the head, so he's, uh, he's complaining. And we, have, we see here um, that it's the organization TP that has uh, built the example app with this, uh, with this thing. Uh, it has been built with the clone compiler, version 13, and so on. Uh, it is this package. It has this license. It has this CPE uh, filter so that you can find vulnerabilities uh, from the NIST database. And uh, you have then uh, the catch two on boost uh, uh, library that, were, that we installed before uh, in your package. And what we are working on at TP, and uh, that's why uh, we, uh, we are also uh, looking for your feedback on your input, is that you have a small um, implementation of, an, of a registry uh, where you can see the dependency that were built, and then you can see uh, for which platform it was built, uh, for which target and so, uh, for which was cached, and uh, you have the list of the dependencies that you can then browse. You can see vulnerabilities, and uh, you have also the SBOM, which is a bit weirdly formatted, but it's a very early uh, version of that. Uh, if you're interested, talk to us. Uh, we, will, we will make it available uh, uh, through the beta phase, but we invited people to join now. So that's it. I know the super interesting part of today. Yeah, this is this is pretty much the reason why we we came together as two different two, two partners, and it's distributed and uh, remote builds. Which, uh, by the way, is after all what pays my salary. So I really need to talk <laughs> about this. So please pay attention. Um, so and, and what do we mean by this? 
It's quite intuitive. It's the ability of a build system to run targets remotely rather than locally and also cache them in such a fashion. We already talked about remote caching, so let's focus on the execution itself. Uh, in that case, what we want is to be able to scale the build as much as possible and not stop at a level of parallelism in the two digits, but go above three digits and four digits. So many things can we even run in parallel at, at a certain point. But at a, at a scale, when the code base is large enough, that makes a lot of, a, a lot of difference. So the first ones that we can look at are the ones that do not support it. So make, ninja, and mason. They have no facility to run distributed builds. Uh, you could do it yourself, which is kind of, what, kind, of what, kind of the approach that we have automated during this partnership, but otherwise you can't do it automatically. Then you have level two, which is Gradle. It does support remote caching, but not remote execution. Once again, the low level of, uh, uh, of granularity doesn't make it as good as it could be. Then FastBuild actually supports distributed builds out of the box. The only limitation really is that you are once again limited by the number, by the compilers that you can use and the languages that you can use. And where, you, where it really shines is with Bazel. So Bazel, uh, yeah, I know, I know. The next talk is about bri bridging CMake and Bazel the other way around. <laughs> um, and so with Bazel, you can remote any target that you can think of. This is partially, partially due to the fact that it considers even tool chains as inputs. So you can send them over as inputs and you can run them as actions. I, I see some edge shaking, which is pretty much correct, actually. Uh, and we've basically bridged the gap by bringing this same protocol to, uh, to CMake thank, together with TP. And this is what Damien is going to talk about next, how, how we did that. Yes. Yeah, so. We thought we can at TP build remotely, like on one big machine, essentially. So when you start a remote build at TP, where, before we were in partnership with Venflow, you were essentially limited by the size, the biggest size of the hardware that varies on all cloud vendors. So in the best case, we could go up to 500 cores. Uh, but that uh, doesn't build uh, everything, and it also uh, can be very expensive based on uh, what uh, kind of reliability you need and so. And uh, we thought that uh, combining actually both approach would be the best because um, the main issue you have, and this is the reason why we selected this uh, cloud-based uh, big machine remoting, is when you are not in the data center of the cluster, you have the issue of uh, communicating to that cluster. And if you have to send for each compiler invocation your sources and get back the O file on uh, send them to another place and so to, to for the linkage, then you actually are losing a lot of time because you are not in a good network. You're, for example, I'm working from the hotel and I cannot use my build farm, whereas that's the place I need it most because I need to make my demo for my talk. And um, what we bought is, uh, what you built is actually uh, the, a, digit, a digital twin of the developer laptop. So when we start a build, the first level of caching restores everything on a machine in the cloud that is sitting in the same data center as the cluster. And then we, this machine is driving the build on the remote cluster. So you don't even need also to pull the binaries back uh, on your local machine. So you can also work from a small laptop where you don't have uh, all the binaries. And when you want, you can pull them back. You can get the one you want or you can run them there. And also because we can uh, scale up and down this big machine, we can make a, a linkage uh, step, a linker step that is uh, on, big, on a lot of RAM so that you can link very big application uh, without crashing. Uh, and without uh, having insane cost in terms of cluster. And uh, the quality of the implementation of the uh, cluster on this side makes the thing absolutely insane. As it's, uh, it's, uh, I, I've already seen that in my life. So let's check if it's true. Um, so here, I no, that was the, the main oh, no, not that, no, one. not that one, yeah. <laughs> um, so here I have um, I, I have the the, the Clang um, uh, build actually, and uh, we uh, we it's a it's a port of uh, Clang that is supporting Swift uh, on Windows and so, and so uh, we are building it on a very small cluster, uh, 64 cores, just uh, for the purpose of the demo. We don't need to go to 10,000 uh, right ahead. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and, uh, and this is using a special toolchain from us because you can also build with native Windows, but we noticed that this was way faster to build with uh, MSVC on Linux. And uh, yesterday, uh, there was a lightning tool from Yannick uh, about that. 
and you get a 10 to 20% increase of performance just by using the IO scheduler. And then naturally you have the cluster and so on that works. And actually when you run this command, it's the same as you would run locally. And uh, then TP is just like launching the build and uh, building the full LLVM uh, remotely. Uh, there is a, a small uh, synchronization step first to uh, make the mirroring. And uh, then we get uh, actually uh, the build running on the cluster and uh, the full clean build is cached if there is input that were cached that are built at the same time by other users. And um, you, get, uh, you can get then the binary back with TP download and so. And uh, yeah, here's starting the, 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 the developer twin. It's the first time he starts it. And uh, then he, he actually builds uh, LLVM remotely and uh, then he can distribute the load. And this can be, uh, for a build that will normally uh, last 30 minutes, uh, it lasts uh, three minutes uh, in that configuration. And uh, we should have it right ahead. While we wait for the build, we have an open beta that we've just started as of yesterday. If you want to try remote execution, reproducible builds, and all this nice stuff, just head over to either uh, angelo.com or tp.build, and you can give it a try. And give us some feedback, hopefully positive feedback. I want to have a job next month, please. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I think the connection is very slow to the to from here to the. Yeah, if you want to try the beta, don't try it from this hotel, please. <laughs> and that's the only disclaimer. It's gonna be closer my laptop. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's 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 currently now running. You see, toolchain file from the proxy. We are compiling on the. On the cluster, it was the, the first build, ah, and uh, we don't have, ah, you touched the. the oh, the, sorry. <laughs> okay, so, so we have, we have the, 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 the CMake list that is being built, and uh, we have the build happening uh, remotely. Uh, we are working on implementing the BIP uh, protocol uh, so that you can have a, a build event protocol so that you can see what happens. Uh, in the meantime, there is a, a, a very nasty UI that you have to improve. Uh, but uh, that's, uh, that's basically it. And um, if you want to, uh, to try it out yourself, uh, just go either on Enflow website, which is a partner, or on, uh, on our website to get access to the things we showed, like remote build distribution, uh, SBOM generation, um, uh, the registry that is coming out, uh, just register for the beta. There are stuff that are in open source. There are stuff that requires us to have some infrastructure behind. Uh, we are very happy to talk on the, to uh, get your build to fly. And hey, if you use Blazor, we got that too. Thank you. Questions? No question? Oh, it's one question. Thanks for the great talk. Um, my question is from the uh, point of view of sort of the end developer. So on the assumption that like someone else is setting up the, um, uh, the build system, whether that's CMake or Bazel or something else, setting up all the tool change, the sort of end developer, um, just like going and building their code. My impression is that like, Overall, Bazel gives a, a nicer experience in a lot of ways than CMake. Um, and so my question is basically, to what extent does that like ring true with your experience? And to what extent does the, uh, the TP shown here sort of close that gap? So apologies for any misunderstandings along the way, but go for it. Oh, thanks. So, so the question is uh, that uh, Bazel is uh, hard to set up, but if, once it's set up, it's easier to use for uh, developers that don't have to deal with the build system. And the question is if uh, what you are doing with the CMake uh, remote execution beta, if that is helping in uh, bringing the, ca the capabilities and the property of Bazel uh, to CMake, and the reply is definitely yes. We are tr bringing the same uh, isolation uh, property. Uh, the remoting is uh, even uh, 
further uh, away with uh, the two layer of caching and two layer of uh, build uh, uh, distribution in the cloud. On the, or we have a vertical scaling of the digital twin and an horizontal one of the cluster. So it's, uh, it's, it's definitely making the life of CMake user uh, better and simpler. I mean, I use CMake over this client all the time when I code. And uh, I never think about how I need to like call configure myself or uh, write uh, some fine package. Or so it's all easier because uh, of uh, the the tooling that is there and of the two chain files that are set up. And, yeah. and you can still naturally hack it if you want. Yeah. There, there is also like an additional property actually. By, by virtue of running in remote execution, you do run in a sandboxed environment, and so we do have a mechanism to provide that reproducible development environment that is. Bit different from what Bazel normally gives you, and it's something that we do support as an engine. So you could specify a Docker image, for example, and use that to create your own environment, which is even easier than what Bazel uh, provides you with. Cool. Is there a concise um, summary of like whatever gaps in either direction might remain once you've added that TP enhancement to CMake between that and like a standard Bazel setup? Uh, yes, I actually kind of published a blog post yesterday about this integration. Not a plant. Not a plant. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for that. Uh, and yeah, this is... It should be... I don't remember where I put the blog post. Uh, <laughs> oh, the first one. The first one, yeah. And um, there are some gaps, uh, first of all, in, uh, in, in the, the tools themselves. We, we use this tool for, uh, to, to remote actions, which is called uh, Goma. Uh, there is an even better tool from Google, which is also acts like a compiler wrapper, and is called Reclient, that does provide you more flexibility. So right now, one of the gaps is that we're not truly language agnostic. We do support more languages than just C and C++, but we're not truly language agnostic. And we could also, we could also simplify the infrastructure by migrating to this, to this other tool. There is what it just mentioned, the gap of having a good build observability remotely. Because when you run remotely, then you have N environments you need to take care of, and they're all sandboxed. And they're all different from your local environment. And you want the same debugging experience, which is why it's important to implement this BEP protocol, which is a build event protocol that basically sends all these events about your build remote. It's like a remote ninja log, for example. And so this, these are, I think, the, the two biggest gaps that I see. And we, we need to remote more than just compilations and linking. We need to, remote, we need to be able to remote cogeneration. We need to remote comp different compilers and so on. And hopefully even tests, because tests is where you have the biggest parallelism possible, because they, no they have no interdependencies. So those are the gaps, in my opinion. Damien? Yeah, I mean, there, there is the two layers. So when, if the, the, the compile of wrapper or the command wrapper doesn't support distributing on the cluster, it can still fall back on big machines on the single digital twin. So if you have a language that is not yet supported, it can still build on 100 cores or so uh, in the first machine until it's supported, essentially. But C, C++ on test execution, this is, uh, it is like unit test execution, this works, actually. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's more like uh, some code gen yeah. on proto console that are not necessarily uh, supported directly on the cluster. Thanks for making people's builds better. Thanks. You're welcome. <laughs>